welcome to this podcast hosted by Theology and Religious Studies at the University of Glasgow in our Hope Against Hope series, exploring spirituality in the context of the climate crisis. My name is Heather Walton and it's my privilege to introduce the people who will be contributing to the discussions in this session on craftivism and climate change. Sarah Corbett is an author, activist and creative maker. She's the founder of the Craftivist Collective, an important international movement that seeks to promote radical change through bringing people together to make beautiful objects and to shape hopes and visions. Anna Fisk is a feminist theologian who undertook her doctoral research here at Glasgow and worked as a researcher and lecturer here for several years. She is also an artist and climate activist and she's researched and written on women, spirituality and crafting, as well as on the characteristics of a healthy climate justice movement. Claire Radford will chair the session and engage Anna and Sarah in discussion. Claire also studied for her doctorate here at Glasgow and worked as a researcher here. She's now moved to Manchester University, where she is a fellow, a research associate at the Lincoln Theological Institute. Hello, I'm Claire Radford and I'm delighted to be joined by both Anna Fisk and Sarah Corbett in discuss discussing spirituality, craft and climate justice activism. We've got some questions first for Anna and then we'll be talking to Sarah and then we'll join in together for some questions at the end. So Anna, you're a knitter and a theologian and a climate justice activist. Can you tell us a little bit more about how you see the relationship between these craft practices, theology and spirituality, and environmental activism. Mm, so I've been thinking quite a lot recently about how um, craft as spirituality, um, or craft as at least as a kind of form of spirituality, is, is something that can be really helpful in, in grounding um, activism, any kind of activism, but particularly um, climate activism that I'm involved with. Um, so I started knitting about 20 years ago now um, as a, um, you know, as a teenager, I had a lot, um, I'd had mental health issues, depression since I was, um, since I was very young. Um, and I found that with knitting, this general sense that I don't want to be here I don't I, um there's there's kind of nothing that I enjoy doing um was kind of taken away for a few moments and that I would kind of actually be engaged in what I was doing I would have something mm -hmm. that would help me get through the day but also help me think about the next day and maybe the next day seemed that something I could I could tolerate um or, or maybe even enjoy um mm -hmm. And so fast forward another kind of 10 years or so, um, and I was, while I was still doing my PhD and I was um, thinking a lot about the kind of the role that knitting and that craft had in my life um, and how it was such an, it's such an important thing to me. Um, it was like a really key part of my identity, even though I kind of described myself as a <laughs> probably knitter first in these, these list of things that I am. And, um, and then I was thinking about the parallels between religion and, and my craft practice. Um, and then it was something that I started um, researching with other knitters, um, mm -hmm. looking at how, how a craft can be a form of spirituality. And I was using a kind of fairly loose definition of the word spirituality, which is quite a loaded word in religious studies, but thinking of spirituality as something that connects us with a sense of something greater. Um, and they kind of came out of these interviews that I did with other people and with my um, reading around the topic, which included reading Sarah's work. It's really exciting to be to be with her um, today. Um, but, but so there's kind of these various themes that came out of that work. Um, one um, that in, in some ways I've touched on is how knitting and how craft can be really helpful for mental health as um, as, as, a, as a form of mindfulness, as something that kind of holds you in the moment, that, that's good for well-being. For a lot of women I was talking to, it was kind of a, a way of um, carving out some time for themselves, so, um, some, a way of celebrating themselves, um, which is often a, a key form of kind of more new age spirituality, it can be this, this sense of um, 
of connecting with yourself. Um, but also, um, and there's been a lot of research done into that, um, but what I was also interested in was coming out with, um, from the work I was doing was it as being a way of, um, of connecting with um, the things that are most important to you, um, whether that being your kind of personal connection. So like if you've got a new baby coming or a, a grandchild or, or a, you, just people, someone will always knit clothes for them. Or if somebody's getting married, they'll knit mm -hmm. a wedding shawl um, and people will also, it's a way of celebrating friendships. Um, uh, again, there'd been quite a lot of work done on that. Um, but what I was also seeing coming out was it being a way of um, people marking their political commitments, so making mm. things as a way of, of doing activism, so the craftivism that, again, we'll hear a lot more um, from Sarah about. Um, and, um, and I did some, some things of that myself, so with a, a local land struggle, I did a community yarn bombing um, project, um, knitting lots of kind of birds and, and beasties and flowers and things like that to kind of decorate a local space that we were tr trying to um, save from the council selling. Um, and then later on when I was kind of got really involved with um, climate activism a few years ago, did a knitted banner and things like that. Um, so this is a way of saying something's really important to me and therefore I'm going to spend time making it into mm. something with wool, into yarn. And I thought it was really interesting because in a way there's not there's no practical reason to do things like like that, um, but we still want to spend time, um, you know, sitting down using materials, using our bodies um, as this way of almost sacralizing these things that we care about. Um, but another thing that I noticed in my own craft practice, and, and a lot with the people that I know and the people that I was interviewing, that was, that people were using their craft as a way of connecting with the material world around them, and of connecting with nature. So this time of year is, is like a big one for me, because I'm always just suddenly everything I want to make, I want it all to be yellow and gold and red. Um, mm -hmm. And um, because of the leaves around me, it's like, it's like that you're seeing something that's it's beautiful and important and, and precious and, and kind of wanting to mirror that in the things that I'm making. Um, and, and that's ended up being something that was important to me also in, I do needle felting, so making wee sculptures with, um, um, with wool and I would often make, and also, and also pictures and I would, um, and I do natural dyeing, dyeing with plants. Um, and that's mm -hmm. something where you kind of have to really get to know um, the world around you to have a kind of an understanding of what different plants are and how they um, and how they can work in the dye pot uh, what colours you can get from them which often aren't the colours that you expect um, and it makes you think about things like harvesting responsibly and then so at first I was doing this um, when I lived in a flat and it was mostly through foraging um, and it would often be when I'd be walking and I'd have to pay attention to the plants that I'd see around me mm. so I found that through my craft practice I was paying more attention to the world around me and I was connecting with it more um, and and then later um, having a house with a garden um, it, it's a, a big my craft practice is still a, a big part of me kind of tending to the the land that I have responsibility for so so it's a kind of been a big way of having a um, having a sense of relationship um, with um, with the world around me um, so yeah making me that I'm working with nature not just using materials as a resource but as a as a collaborator mm. um, so this so thinking a bit about this kind of brought me back to when I was first thinking about that connection between knitting and my mental health um, and it brought me back to this quote from Rowan Williams on the um, radio series a history of the world in a hundred objects um, and he was talking about um, in the British Museum there's a um, swimming reindeer sculpture it's from it's from the ice age and it's from um it's carved from a reindeer tusk um tusk do reindeers even have tusks i don't know no <laughs> oh. an antler it's carved from an antler <laughs> yes i pay so much attention Amazing. to the world yeah. around me now reindeers <laughs> have tusks um so <laughs> anyway it's this really beautiful really naturalistic bit of sculpture and you see it and you can't believe something so so amazing so small and mm. it's so old and you kind of really get this sense of kind of connection across the centuries with the people who made it um but something that rowan williams said about it um that was really um kind of struck me was that what you the sense that you get of the art around 
this time is a sense of humanity of people um, really being at home in the world, um, that, that making things as a way of, of being at home in the world. This isn't just somewhere where we kind of happen to live, um, but this is somewhere where we're really dwelling, that we're really connected with. Um, and um, and I think that's really, really important when we're, we're dealing with the climate crisis or, and the ecological crisis, that, that we have this sense of that we are, that we belong to the world, that it's not a case of protecting a planet that's separate from us, um, but, but also that we have this sense of enchantment by and love of, um, you know, the, the world that we live in now, um, as much as, you know, as spoiled as so much of it is. Um, and as at risk as so much of it is that we sh that we shouldn't just look at the look at the horror and look at the the scary things, but also really celebrate those the things that are beautiful and the things that we love and the things that are precious and worth saving. Um, and that is that is something that can kind of sustain us in in acting for for the world and for and for climate justice for um, for other people um, as well as as well as for an idea of kind of nature. Okay. Yeah, I absolutely love what you're talking about in terms of that sense of uh, attention and connection, whether that's personal, or political or ecological. Um, and I know that some of your research has been around looking at the relationship between the practice of crafting as a response to particular emotions such as grief and grief around the climate. And um, can you tell us a little bit more about these kind of connections in relation to climate activism? Yeah, because that's such an interesting question, because, yes, I have been thinking a lot about climate grief um, and um, and about the issue of grief and, and anxiety in um, in response to the climate crisis. Um, and I never really put the two things together because I'd also um, been as part of my research with knitters. Um, I ended up interviewing a lot of people who they were making especially shawls interestingly but making objects um after somebody had died and it being a way of working through bereavement um and i hadn't really ever thought about about doing crafting that is focusing on um climate or ecological issues or indeed on on, on doing craftivism as a way as as being grief work um and I'm just I'm just trying to think of any examples of people that I that I know of, of people doing doing it specifically as grieving, and I and I can't think of any. But um, it's interesting to me that we're seeing a lot more rituals around um, climate change. Um, so, for example, having they were having kind of almost funerals for glaciers that are no longer mm. glaciers um, because because of the warming of the earth and and I think that a lot of activism that we have seen is, um, or for a long time, activism has has been a lot about ritual and about public performance of grief. But that's something that um, we're probably going to see probably quite a lot of in Glasgow over the next over the next few weeks um, with COP twenty six. Um, and I think it would be really interesting to to use um, use craftivism in that way. Um, I've been thinking a lot about lament as this kind of theological category um, that people have been talking about um, quite a lot recently um, as a way of thinking of, of climate of the climate crisis um, as something that um, can encompass the sense of the complexity of the issue, the extreme injustice. It, it isn't as simple as us just being really, really sad that some nice fluffy animals mm -hmm. that we like are 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 dying there is these real issues of injustice and that the people who um, are least um, responsible for the climate change are the ones who are most affected by it um, and that um, and being able to kind of name those issues as part of the grief is also really important so um, yeah I, I can see that and that's going to be just really important work going forward that rather than just um, us just kind of pointing to kind of certain climate criminals or um, or kind of making certain demands, but also just really thinking through um, think, um, the kind of larger meanings and craft can be a, a real way of doing that. Yeah, absolutely. I 
see in your work a lot of those kind of different connections and kind of uh, real thoughtfulness around those. And um, I really appreciated some of your own writing on your blog, where you've been reflecting on some of the different issues surrounding that message of apocalypse, kind of notion of the end of the world, time running out, of deadlines surrounding the climate crisis. Um, can you say a little bit more about this and how that influences your thinking, both about craft and activism? Yes, yeah, so um, with and we're getting it so much around COP26, it's um, all this, this is our last chance. This is this big moment to, for us to still be able to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees, um, that, that things have to be, emissions have to be limited by 2030. Um, and there's there's so much messaging around this um, and this sense of that there is going to come a point where certain things are too late that we've cropped that we've, mm -hmm. there's a deadline and that de um, so even in Glasgow at the moment there's a climate clock they've um, projected um, the amount of time a countdown to to when to, to the world being able to limit um, global warming to 1.5 degrees. Um, and I think it's quite interesting how that intersects with um, Christian theology, um, with with how much our tradition is, I say our as somebody from a Christian background, um, how much um, we, we think of um, things in terms of endpoints and in terms of time as being linear. Um, and and you see that so much with the, with the climate discourse. Um, and I think that a problem problem with that I mean there are very practical problems um firstly I think the sense that there is a particular point where things become too late are much too simple and you kind of end up with people misunderstanding things so thinking we've only got well three years ago it was 12 years to save the world I guess I guess now that means there's only nine or um um and that really ignores that the climate crisis is very much something that's already here and also that its roots are centuries old um, and also um, that having a kind of this sense of urgency that there's a certain certain point or these certain events that are so crucial and that if things don't quite work out during them, that can also lead to kind of a form of act activism in which people are kind of presenting, working as saviours um, and, and that can uh, lead to burnout as well. And um, and I think another another connection with that is that's again thinking theologically really interesting is how much um, connected with the Christian tradition um, but then also with colonialism and capitalism that also um, is connected to our kind of Christian heritage mm -hmm. is the sense of time as a regulator it's this it's that we're all kind of slaves to the clock mm -hmm. in a sense um, and that time is a resource that can be consumed that we can use mm -hmm. up that we have too much of that we run out of or that we try and buy and sell um, but these these kind of modes of thinking are part of the you know these very modern modes of thinking that are part of the crisis that that got us here um, and then another and coming back to craft again something that's very interesting around a lot of thinking around craft if it, is that it's always um, very much opposed to the modern it's this sense that it you're connecting to something ancient when you're doing craft and it and, and I think whether or not that's true or um, isn't really so much the, the point is that we're making things by hand as being an alternative to um, modern forms of life that have that have led to the situation that we're in now um, but that was kind of an aside but going yeah going <laughs> back to this issue of um, of apocalypse and there's even the word crisis is kind of like a crisis is mm. like a decisive moment and in a way yeah the climate crisis is a decisive moment but it's not just one that's just here now it's a very it's a very slow crisis um a really um helpful um way of thinking about it is as being of slow violence actually mm. um that um that the things like like colonialism and and like the climate crisis are things whose effect that who that happened very slowly and that's effects have, have gone very slowly and I think that maybe only to some extent our response needs to be slow as well um, so in activism around it it's not just a case of going all oh, right we've we've got to do everything in this short amount of time and got to do as much as possible 
Um, and my thinking here is again, is again very influenced by, by Sarah's work, but I think that, that slow crafts like, like knitting, like stitching can be a way of refusing that, that mode of thinking and it can be a way of subverting it. And, and craft is actually, a lot of it is about time. I mean, when you, whenever you knit something, often people who don't, who aren't knitters themselves will say, oh, how long did it take you to make that? And it's kind of like, I don't know, because I wasn't thinking <laughs> of it in terms of time or, or this was a, something that takes a long time and the it's, it's timefulness as part of its value, but also because it took me out of time. And I find that when I'm making things, I'm, more, I'm very much in the moment. Um, going back to mindfulness but it's also very much looking to the future for me when you're making something you're turning transforming something from to, into being something else um, mm. and to, uh, and that's looking looking to the future and and I think crafters are also often it, it will depend on the craft but certainly um, I find that it's quite cyclical like I say at this time of year I'm always thinking about autumn colors in what I'm knitting um, quite often I'll make something and then later decide actually I don't that's not quite right I'm going to undo it and make something else and again that's something that can disrupt this kind of linear start point end point way of thinking um, and again maybe reflect more perhaps you know um, indigenous um, modes of thinking that are more um, you know, in I don't, I don't want to use kind of cliches like in harmony or in tune but I'm going to anyway because it's simpler right now um, but you may be more healthy um, ways of relating relating to the earth and to ecology and to each other yeah absolutely thank you uh, we're now going to bring Sarah in to talk about some of these similar and shared issues um, so Sarah, thank you for being with us. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about how you see the relationship between spirituality, climate justice, and gentle protest craftivism? Sure, Claire, it's a juicy topic. I feel like everyone could talk for hours about it. Um, so for me, spirit, I'm a practicing Christian and I came from a Christian background, my dad's local vicar, um, and my mom is a Christian. She's also a politician, um, which, definitely influences my work. Um, but for me, spirituality is not just me as a Christian. I studied religions and theology at Manchester University, and I loved it and looked at lots of different religions. It's about seeing everyone as a complex human being, and it's not just a physical body. We have souls or spirits or however you want to use that language of we're more than just this thing, and we're more than just this this physical planet so spirituality for me is very holistic looking it's very much focusing on people as unique individuals and for me it's everyone made in the image of God but all unique individuals and different contexts and different gifts and talents um, and that in terms of looking at climate justice or any justice um, for me justice isn't just changing a law or a policy it is also changing system structures behaviors cultures mindsets like justice is so messy <laughs> and not binary and not that transactional it is very you know messy and everything's woven in together you know it's not black and white of you're wrong we're right here's a quick easy answer and that's the same for climate justice. So I grew up very much in an activist background. I grew up in West Everton in Liverpool. Um, age three, I was squatting in social housing to save them from demolition. We got both bishops involved in Liverpool, David Shepherd and Warlock involved in our campaign and we won that campaign. And I was also, as an eight year old, I went to South Africa with my dad's sabbatical to learn about the peace and reconciliation work of Tutu and Mandela in 91. So Mandela had just got out. So very much a background of activism, not of craft at all. I learned to craft from YouTube 12, 13 years ago when I started doing craftivism. But what really drives me and what I think craft can be really useful in the world of activism and in the world of trying to, you know, help fulfill the potential of our world in terms of it being a healthy place and a happy place and a harmonious place for everyone is that I think craft is a great way to do what I call gentle protest so gentle as in not passive or weak but very much hard work <laughs> you know linked to the fruit to the spirit linked to self-control emotional intelligence humility you know challenging your own ego not 
um, treating people how you want to be treated, not demonizing politicians, not looking for quick fixes or clicktivism or slacktivism stuff. Um, I think craft can be a really useful tool for this gentler, slower, but also more humble and more intimate form of activism, particularly with power holders. So I don't use craft as just to grieve. I mean, a lot of our projects, the, we use the process right. of craft to channel your negative emotions into something positive so at the beginning absolutely with climate justice we should be able to grieve um, and I know later on we'll talk about the canary project I've just been doing pre-cop but using some of that process to grieve and say this is awful and I should be angry about climate injustice and I should be sad about the world not being able to fulfill its potential but if I just sit in that sadness and that anger that's not helpful for anyone it's not helpful for my mental health it's not helpful for the world so it's using craft as a way to engage in social change acknowledge it but move from just reacting a lot of activism is still very reactive of I'm angry you should listen to me being angry but saying actually is that how we change our hearts and minds and our actions as individuals if we were a power holder probably not if someone's just screaming at us saying you're wrong and I'm angry and you should listen to me that's sadly not how we engage with issues and we know from neuroscientists and positive psychologists about how the way our brain works is we need to have a solution to aim towards and not just be told about a problem. If we only focus on a problem, we go into fight, flight or freeze mode. So we, again, we, again, we don't progress whether we're a politician or whether we're an activist protester on the street. So really thinking about how to see everyone, especially power holders as unique individual human you know, souls and spirits, how, what power do they have in climate justice that's realistic, that we can ask them to be part of the solution, not part of the problem, but not demonize them or other them or say that you can't be part of the solution, you've got to just leave, we'll fix it. Um, and also asking for realistic solutions within healthy time frames. coming back to time, you know, it's very easy as a campaigner to say, you need to do this now, but actually is that empathetic to power holders who have lots of demands on them where politics isn't that easy. They'll have opposition and they'll have people who, you know, they might oppose what you're saying um, or they might really agree with what you're saying, but they have to work within messy structures and how then that gentleness can be used to acknowledge power holders as human beings and as flawed human beings like the rest of us and how we can help and encourage them to do the best role that they can in a realistic way and in a way that keeps us hopeful um, and not demonizing power holders but hope for the best in them and hope for the best in us that we can all be change makers together that's where I sort of see how spirituality climate justice and gentle protest craftivism sort of weaves in together if that makes any sense at all Claire <laughs> Yeah, and you, you started to mention the Canary Project that you're working on at the moment. And I know that um, in all of your gentle protest craftivism, you've worked in this way of uh, creating crafted symbols to convey messages on specific issues. Mm -hmm. um, and you've done this in kind of specific climate projects. So uh, in your project supporting the Cl Climate Coalition around COP21, you use the image of wearing your heart on your sleeve. So kits for stitching a green heart for people to literally wear on their sleeve. Oh, yeah. um, and you, you mentioned the current campaign where you're using this image of the yellow canary and various crafts around that image too. Uh, so can you tell us a little bit more about making and using these particular symbols as part of climate activism? Yeah, I mean, one thing, so my background in activism, you know, as a kid in school, um, and then also I worked for Christian Aid and Oxfam and the Department for International Development, and I still work a lot with different charities. I work a lot with the Climate Coalition, but also I do consultancy for different charities and projects, as well as working with museums and galleries and places where you don't see activism. That's re really where I'm passionate about bringing activism into places and into places where people don't see themselves as activists at all. So, you know, I run the Global Craftivist Collective, but I'm not about preaching to the converted or just giving another activism tool to existing activists. It's really where I 
see the strength in what I do and where I can be of best use is to bring people into activism who don't see themselves as political or who don't see themselves as the typical activists. So they might not see themselves as left-leaning or political at all. They don't want to be divisive or confrontational. A lot of introverts who don't even like being in big groups, lots of anxious people. So really trying to use craft as a gentle way to engage people in activism who, because they don't see themselves as activists, often with politicians and with um, business leaders, they're seen as even more influential because those power holders suddenly go, oh, yikes, if they care about this issue and they're either not directly impacted by it or they're not the typical activist we expect, that means that maybe more of the mainstream care about this issue. And now I'm maybe a bit more worried about whether I'm going to get voted in again or whether customers are going to buy what we want. So really trying to engage people who don't see activism for them um, or are quite nervous of activism and only see it as big and loud and shouty and judgmental. And with all activism, we often forget about how important beauty is, I think. So I talk a lot about how beauty isn't a luxury add-on. Actually, we can, you know, compete with beauty by, you know, you look at nature and it, Darwin didn't just say it was survival of the fittest, it was also survival of the prettiest. Of the, you know, it was in, how can we attract people like bees to honey, not bees to vinegar? And what I love about this amazing world we're in that I do think that has had a, a creator God um, have a hand in it is the power of colors, of shapes, of symbols. So our heart on your sleeve campaign. It's not a red heart, it's a green heart. You wear it on your sleeve, on your wrist or on your shoulder and you stitch what you love about the world. So I've put Liverpool because I'm from Liverpool, but it might say wine, it might say bluebells, what it might say your Teddy's name, which a child's did for us. It might be your grandchild's name, which I, one of our um, older craftivists did. And you wear it on this green heart linked to climate and you think about how can I help protect this thing that I love from climate and how can I encourage others? But because it's a green heart and because it's on your arm and it's clearly handmade and not mass produced and it's taken time to be done, it's not machine made. Those symbols and that strange shape means that people often say, why are you wearing a green heart and why is it on your sleeve and not on your chest or your bag? So it creates an opportunity for people to ask you a question. And if people ask you a question, they naturally want to hear the answer rather than with a lot of um, protesting. It's a placard saying, listen to us now, whether we're asking you to listen to us or not, we're demanding it. So it's sort of a change and shift in power dynamics. And again, with the psychology of people are more open-minded if they chose to ask a question than if something's being pushed on them so you know a heart is a positive image green is a very calm um color we use fonts that are curly fonts um, and over your own handwriting because that shows uniqueness and it isn't as, as loud as spiky capital letters and then with the canary project it was very different um which was this summer and um, really trying to engage people who've never done climate action before don't see themselves as um campaigners and particularly in the uk um engaging with people who are from conservative constituencies and where you don't normally see activism so more towns and villages than big cities and the canary just felt like a real really good image you know you think of canaries that i'm talking specifically about yellow ones yellow is a very hopeful color so it's not everything's not red and black which is a different vibe to things yellow is a hopeful color it's an active color it's a warm yellow not a cold yellow it's got a bit of orange in which is active but not as active as red that i'm wearing they are naturally very small canaries. They're domesticated. We see them as quite cute, but also we've got that history of them in the coal mines where coal miners saw them as colleagues and friends, not as just tools or objects to use. And they would sing a lot. So the male canaries would sing and chirp away and the, the 
miner would take them down in the coal mines with them and they'd sing away and sometimes the miners would sing with them and when the canary started getting more quiet and sleepy the coal miner loved their colleague so much that it was really the motive for them was to get out of the coal mine to, to help their friends not help them and then they'd put them in little oxygen boxes to help them be healthy again and what I love about that symbol is we, we were making handmade canaries for politicians. So one each saying, I'm really worried about um, the world. I love the world we live in. I love chirpy canaries. I love the beauty in the world. I love our area for whatever reason it is that you love your constituency. And it really worries me that we are having a, a climate catastrophe happening and we want to encourage you, you know, use this little canary that we name them all to personify them and make sure that they're not just seen as objects. So we had people call them lots of funny little names. You know, we'd say in our handwritten letters to politicians, here's a very friendly, lively little bird. It's not dead to create despair. It's live and chirpy. And we would love you to put it on your desk or on your shelf or somewhere in your office for you as an MP and your staff to see and be encouraged to be part of the solution before it's too late. Um, so they are, they're not seen as aggressive, they're seen as those critical friends to miners as, and we wanted to use that story and that symbol to be critical friends to politicians. And what's so lovely is that politicians are shocked by how many hours people spend knitting, crocheting, felting, what, however they make their canary and people do spend hours making them and giving them with their handwritten letters. And because they're small and not big, they fit into, politicians have very small offices, especially in parliament. So we were very considerate about, we don't wanna give them something big that they are gonna end up in a bin bag somewhere or cause you know, annoyance. It's about these small little delicate creatures to say, we're holding you account, we're looking at you with our little birdie eyes, but we're also encouraging you to be part of creating a cleaner, greener future and cleaner, greener constituency. So all of those elements really make it much more memorable because we remember stories much more than facts and statistics as well as, especially if the statistics are too big, our brains can't quite um, figure them out. But also because the object is handmade, every all of them are unique. They take hours. We don't send lots of canaries. It's quality, not quantity. And it's about offering this little tool for conversation and hopefully for a critical friendship rather than being a aggressive anim enemies um, it, it made all of those elements those design elements and those visual elements and the story of canaries makes it much more memorable and harder to dismiss as something by a loud activist who just wants to tell me what to do or by someone who's just trying to show off with something that they've made that's really big it sort of disarms politicians and power holders um, and we've used similar symbols and techniques in the past where we gave gift we had gave handkerchiefs to the board of Marks and Spencers just 14 board members to say don't blow it use your power for good and um, we really want to encourage you in your important roles and they were handkerchiefs bought from Marks and Spencers and all completely unique with unique quotes that were timeless quotes about how to be a change maker in your role specifically to how each board member we thought who would they admire not who do we admire but which quotes would they resonate with and what colors do they wear let's incorporate that into the handkerchiefs really making it bespoke to those board members and within 10 months they announced they were paying the living wage to 50,000 staff and the chair of the board said to me directly that it was because of our gentle protest craftivism that was bespoke, small, not showing off, very intimate, very um, empathetic and compassionate. It stuck in their mind so much. And every time they met, they kept saying to each other, where have you put your hanky? What did your hanky look like? Where did you keep it? And we had a robust argument explaining how it made sense for them to be a living wage employer because it made sense in terms of business efficiency, staff retention, as well as ethics and dignity. So always trying to, yes, use symbols in a hopeful way, but it also has to be alongside robust arguments that are realistic, compassionate, empathetic, and holding people account, but in a respectful, gentle way. Yeah, you were, you were mentioning just there about um, people commenting on how long it might have taken someone 
to mm. create a piece. And I know that in your own work, you've written about this importance of slowness and you know the first point in your Craftivist Manifesto uh, around be the tortoise, taking a slow and mindful approach. And you've drawn on the slow movement in your How to Be a Craftivist book. Um, I'm reflecting on kind of what Anna has already talked about in terms of uh, time uh, and things. Can you tell me a little bit more about the importance of that sense of slowness, especially in this context of feeling urgency around climate activism? Yeah, I mean, a lot of my work can sound so counterintuitive. You know, I talk about slow activism, intimate activism, quiet activism, the Canary Project, we said meet in flocks of two to 12 people, 12 people maximum, because if it's too many people, it'll intimidate and get in the way of people. And it also stops some anxious people to join in. So a lot of my stuff is quite um, topsy-turvy, not for the sake of it, but it feels quite, for me, it feels like common sense. And the more I read about neuroscience and psychology and the more I experience people who've um, done our craftivism the more I think it you know there is a space for it not to replace other forms of activism but to add to the toolkit so to build on from what Anna said about you know we do need time to grieve we need time to slow down and to go against the grain of you know capitalist culture we're in I also think in terms of my focus is very much on how do we engage power holders and how do we change our own hearts and minds, not just tell everyone else what to do. So all of my craftivism projects, which is quite different to other craftivism out there, is I always have crafter thought questions with each project. So every project has different objectives, but there'll be three crafter thought questions that while you're using the process of craft, it's not just craft and whilst you're watching the telly and then you've made something that you can call craftivism and put out in the world you could do that and that's craftivism but I think there's so much more potential to use the process as well as the product to engage more deeply as a craftivist as a gentle protester so it'll be qu quite juicy often uncomfortable questions where you can use the comfort of craft to ask questions like what are my values and how am I threading them through what I do and say and think? So before I ask anyone else to change, am I living out my values, knowing that I can't do it perfectly for budget reasons, capacity or whatever, but really asking those very uncomfortable questions and having the space to do it. And all of my craftivism, most of it is hand embroidery um, or cross stitch so that you don't have to count too much or be too distracted by following a certain pattern once you know what you're doing and your brain starts wandering off because you're doing a repetitive hand action that's when you can engage on those questions in and use the repetitive hand action of craft to slow your regulate your breathing slow down calm down and channel your anger and sadness and overwhelm into being thinking more critically and strategically about okay I really care about this issue but what can I actually do that is gonna help and not be harmful that is gonna create good discussion and engagement and not polarization or division so those craft of thought questions I think are really important for people to do while they're using the process and I have pencils saying capture your craft of thoughts and notebooks and all my workshops I have to remind people to look at their little questions because often we just want to use craft to say I am making something positive for the world and I can just disappear into my love of craft I still make birthday and Christmas presents for people that aren't activism through craft and that's lovely but using the protest to, the process to challenge ourselves just as much as challenging others and that it's getting that balance of yes using the slowness but not being too slow so not being too fast so be the tortoise but I use the tortoise as a good example because it was the tortoise that won the race, not the hare. So the tortoise didn't stay still and didn't not get to the end, but it did it in a steady way that was emotionally intelligent, was sustainable, was thoughtful, intentional, you know, clever in how that they decided to get to the to the end. Um, whereas the hair was just this erratic hair that burnt out, didn't know where it was going. So the tortoise is a good example, I think, of what I mean by slow. I don't mean so slow you don't do anything. And I or you're a perfectionist and then you, you know, freeze and don't do anything, but not um not too fast that you haven't thought through where can I be of best use, what's sustainable for me. 
Am I targeting the right decision makers? I might not be. Am I being realistic on what to ask of them? Am I putting myself in their shoes? But am I also being in solidarity with those people directly affected by an injustice and making sure that they're dignified and I'm not what Anna said about, you know, not slipping into Messiah complex or trying to fix everything yourself, but using the process to really check in and challenge your own ego and your own you know motives and your own baggage and presumptions just as much as using the protest the process to help empower you to take action great thank you i've now got a question for for both of you uh, to join together on um and as the theme of this conversation uh across cop 26 has been hope against hope i was wondering if you could share a little bit about where you see a source of hope or particular practices of hope that you engage with? And I'll come to Anna first. Um, I've been really influenced by Rebecca Solnit's book on hope, um, Hope in the Dark. Um, and I, I, what I really like about that is that hope is not like some kind of midway point between optimism mm -hmm. and pessimism, um, but hope is about taking action when you don't or you know, just keeping going or doing something, even when you don't know what the results are going to be. Um, I think it's about you know saying this is what I love, this is what's really important to me, this is what I value, um, and and I am and it is worth it and it is good and I am going to act for it. Um, and and that isn't always easy. Um, it's very rarely easy. I, I think you know, it's the unknowingness of it that that can be such an issue especially with something like the climate crisis where you know for the rest of our lives we're never going to know um the outcome ultimately of the work that we're doing um and i mean you know especially even when we, we can see um bad impacts here and now um so so that for me is a big source of hope but i am also you know we do there are so many um practical examples of of resistance um, and struggle that is successful. I've got a lot of hope just from the bin workers in Glasgow um, getting the pay rise from their threats to strike. Um, and, and the same with Scott Rail, um, the workers like that. So I think a lot of hope in people coming in collective bargaining um, as well. So that's, that's a massive source of hope for me. Um, yeah, and in, yes, and in the process of making things and just in that, that you know, that sense of things that keep you going yes great thank you i think definitely that sense of solidarity and collective bargaining as a source of hope has been has been great to see uh how about you sarah um yeah i was i was doing a thumbs up to anna's mention of the um Solnet book because I've reread that a million times. Um, I also reread the collection of Martin Luther King's essays, which has often got different titles in different books, but my one is Gift of Love. And I love rereading his um, sermons and lectures um, and speeches because I just think, you know, he was so hopeful still and he had his dream that he clung to, um, but he was also so clever about emotional intelligence about, you know, how the brain works and how to engage people with, you know, and be hopeful in even the people that were directly oppressing him. You know, I think it's quite sober. And actually when I reread a lot of his sermons to keep me going, and I think it can be actually quite a privilege to lose hope and um, because a lot of people who are directly affected by climate change now. So I've met people in Kenya and Ghana. They don't have a chance not to be hopeful. They have to focus on what they can do. Um, which I think is important. And then practically speaking, I have a, I'm changing my habits a lot. Um, the last few years, even before the pandemic, I made a conscious effort to do a gratitude jar in the morning and at night. And now I just have it as a habit that I do like mini prayers, being grateful for different parts of life, whether it's going out for cinnamon buns with a friend yesterday, or whether it's seeing a, my plant grow a little bit or a lovely sunset, like really remembering the beauty in this world, in nature and also in people. Um, I follow a lot of positive news type outlets to remember that people People that are beautiful souls as well um, and complex and we're all flawed and we're a mix of good and bad and everything in between but my 
reading and seeing these lovely stories of kindness and of seeing the beauty in the world and really trying to focus on how can we make the world even more beautiful um, rather than reframing it into how the world is awful really keeps me going. Um, I love human-centered design work now, which is coming a lot more from younger designers. So I work a lot with museums and galleries and universities. And it, I love seeing how students are very much looking at human-centered design and earth-centered design um, rather than design for design's sake, which makes me very hopeful. Um, and then on a, on a, is it selfish note? I don't know, but my world is with these craftivists who often, you know, are, new to activism and nervous of activism or gave up on activism if they were burnt out like Anna mentioned you know burnout is a big thing and to see and see people's individual journeys or journeys in small groups of how they have changed their own habits changed their own mindsets how they have engaged local power holders whether it's politicians or business leaders or head teachers and together they've made tangible change especially at the moment on climate issues you've got lots of craftivists doing stuff with school teachers and religious leaders locally very humbly often behind the scenes and not even sharing it not even tweeting about it just doing it in a very humble service-led way really keeps me hopeful hopeful that there isn't just a quick fix I know the media likes everything to be big and clear and simple and binary but actually a lot of the change that's happening is bottom up um, we need it top down as well especially at cop but a lot of those stories we don't hear of people just quietly getting on with change and things in their communities that are having long lasting positive change and create an even more of a harmonious society where they live really keeps me going and it's those stories that we don't hear about that we sort of actively have to look out for and cling onto to keep that hope in us so that we do make hope possible not just fair convincing great thank you so much and thank you both so much for your uh, time today on uh, your reflections around craft and ecology um, and activism and all the thoughtfulness that you both put into your work so thank you so much Thank you for having us. I hope it was helpful for your viewers and listeners. Thank you.